So today is October the 28th, 2018. It's a Sunday morning. And our message this morning is called From Adulam to the House of Heroes. I want to jump right into the Word of God. Is that a good idea? Yes. Yes. So we're going to be in Psalm 133 to begin. Say there when you were there. Man, some brothers that stepped out of this service picked a bad time to step out of this service. You know, you are blessed that your ears are going to hear what you're about to hear. It's been corroborated. It has been confirmed in every possible way during our worship service. We have a word from God for you. Psalm 133 in verse 1. How good and pleasant. Somebody say it's good. It's good. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Now it's easy to have unity with somebody that you don't have to live together with. But have you ever spent enough time with someone to have trouble being in unity? Like you were great friends when they lived at a distance. But when they came to stay with you, week one was cool. Week two was a bit of strain. And by week three, you were praying that they found a house. To dwell together in community and it be unified is good. It's pleasant. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. When I think of a unified community, something that has just impacted my heart in life, I can't help but think of LCM. And yet we recently saw 10 churches come together in a way that resembles our local fellowship. The impact of the One Association Conference could never be overstated. Since leaving Crystal Lake, we've had to search our heart for the right way to verbalize what the Lord is putting in our hearts. The impact of One Light Ministries when Brent addressed the men of the conference was so profound that it's still echoing in our souls and it will echo in our actions for the years to come, probably throughout our lifetime. Something that Brent told us He said 99% of doctrine may be the same between two churches, but their practice be 100% different. That's incredible. Same statement of faith in totally different ways of life. Developing discipleship programs is not the same as practicing and living in a lifestyle of discipleship. Show you a discipleship book... Brent said, show me your disciples. Discipleship is the foundation of the church. We're not looking to examine programs. We want to examine the fruit and see what the fruit says about the tree. Man, that was a good word from One Light Ministries. That's going to change Indonesia. It's going to change us. It is going to affect the world around us. How many of you we're blessed by seeing 10 churches represented with their sheep. Yes. Amen. Uh, you're not in school. You don't have to raise your hand. You can speak out loud in church. It's going to be okay. I didn't raise my hand in school either. That's why I was in Wade's office so often. <laughs> Interacting with the disciples of the one association, seeing the different churches that have the same foundation, but express their fruit just a little differently it spurred us it's given us a message of triumph a message of victory we want to share that with you today at the conference on a sunday there was a church service held at the rising church how powerful and awesome is that ministry that we visited yeah. tremendous it's tremendous incredible i want to cover a prophecy that was given in tongues and interpreted to start our service here today This is on on Sunday morning, October 15th. When Elder Charlie stepped up and began to speak, 
I believe I saw a scene that Nehemiah describes. This is Nehemiah 316. Beyond him, Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, ruler of a half district of Beth Zor, made repairs up to a point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool and the house of heroes. Pastor Massey earlier mentioned one of those heroes, Shama, who stood in the center of a field and he defended it with his hand frozen to the sword. Long after the religious system had been burned down, after their walls had been destroyed by fire, and the institutions were gone, when Nehemiah went to look to see what remained, there was a marker to a great king, the tomb of David. And the house of the mighty heroes still stood. And when Elder Charlie stepped up, he said, I am a great king, and the house of the mighty ones will stand. This, the One Association 2018, is the building of a house of the mighty heroes. We are seeing what Nehemiah saw out of desolation. Restoration is rising, and in a thousand years, what we will be talking about in the kingdom to come are those that took their stand because of the word of God, and his spirit made them mighty. We will become a house of mighty heroes that nothing can tear down. Amen and amen. When, we're, when the Lord gives us such strong words, the reason that we have it written down is because it's important to us as your pastors. And we know that we're prone to forget things. Anybody ever, the Lord ever spoke to you and within three days you forgot exactly what it was that he yes. spoke to you? Yeah, let's not be in the practice of that as a people. Let's take such value in what God speaks. He spoke some things to us this morning. He's going to continue to speak to us now because he's surely not done. This is something that was amazingly special and your pastors are treasuring it. That's why we have it written. That's why we have it at different places in our homes and, and where we have access to it. In addition to this, Rick Lawhon shared a word this past Wednesday night with us. Man, I want to tell you what a fantastic word that was. If you missed Wednesday for any reason, the reason that we put it on our website, the reason that we put it on our app and on YouTube is so that you can stay and understand what the Lord is speaking to us. This topic that Rick shared was on his heart and in his home prior to the conference. Somebody say prior. Prior. Man, you know when it's the Lord, is it's, you, he, it's, he's speaking it to many of us. And what Rick did is he presented it, and it was titled, Unfinished Business, Men to the Maximum. Thank you, Rick, for that word. Thank you, Susan, for that powerful exhortation to show ourselves men and finish the work. Let's start where he was uh, in Nehemiah. Let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. Let's take a look at verse 11. Nehemiah 2, 11. It says this, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. Somebody say, few men. Few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one that I was riding on. When you see the words, few men, I want to show you a logo that God gave us some time ago for the One Association. There's odd wording on it. It says, few in number. That's because God always shows a smaller group something that they are supposed to engage a larger group with. 12 springs, for instance, that would feed 70 palm trees. A few number of churches that would begin to influence a much larger group. And the thing that makes the few number of churches unique is that they're one in purpose. That's something that you don't see very often. It's a unique thing, even a strange sight. The task before Nehemiah and the task before us is a huge task. But so is the reward. What we're going to accomplish by uniting with each other and uniting with the churches is something that is foundational to the movement of God in our time. As we move forward today, we hope to lay this task out before you and to give you the opportunity to join in it with your entire heart. We want to make it plain for you so you know exactly what choice is before you. How many of you like things clear? Amen. We're going to pick back up in Nehemiah 2 in verse 13. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates 
which had been destroyed by fire. Friends, God put something in Nehemiah's heart, and he's put something in our hearts to do. And like Nehemiah, we've had to examine what is going on around us. We've had to examine our own hearts, how we interact with church culture, how we examine the traditions that have gone before us. One of the things that we've noticed is that when Nehemiah surveyed this wall, he began to count the cost. We know that what we are teaching is not popular. That's why we didn't put a thousand seats in this room. We want the number of men that we can appropriately disciple. And we want to teach those men to disciple their families. We believe that if you start at the head of the household, the whole household will get right. But if you do not start with the head, then you create something that doesn't work as it was designed. So Nehemiah goes out and he surveys the situation. He walks around the remnants of the wall. He was looking at weaknesses that were created by an earlier devastation. This is very similar to a pastor knowing the condition of his flock. I know all kind of pastors that know the number of their flock. But I don't know very many pastors that know the condition of their flock. We care nothing for numbers. We care everything for your condition. Nehemiah examined the breaches. He concluded that it had to be rebuilt. Man, Rick Lawhon preached such an amazing word on that. Well, as the leadership of the One Association and this church has examined the church world, we see that it's much in the same shape as Jerusalem's walls. What is popular among Christians today is not a biblical foundation. And it is unpopular to call that out. Everybody wants us to play nice and just get along. Christians are revolutionaries. We are not neat little bow-tied quiet school children. We are here to effect change in the world. Not to live in the world without changing anything around us. In Nehemiah 2.17, he goes on. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer live in disgrace. It is a disgrace when the house of God does not look like God. When there's leprosy in the house of God, you have to scrape the walls. You have to pull out stones. You have to do something different. When there's leprosy in a human heart, you have to do the same thing. And we're unashamed about that. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. What we will lay before you is what God's hand is upon us to do. And what the king has said to us, not something we read in a book or got through a popular survey, what God has said to us. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. The incomplete work left to us over the last 2,000 years by the generations before us is unacceptable. It is unacceptable that we stand praying for the return of Jesus and half of the world does not know about the first coming of Jesus. That is unacceptable. Amen. It is unacceptable that we will go to lunch today somewhere, your home or a restaurant, and so much of the world doesn't have clean water. It's unacceptable. It is unacceptable that many would perish and die and go to hell while we lavish in teaching after teaching. That is unacceptable to us. Amen. Is it unacceptable to you? Yes. Yes. The foundations that most churches are built on would be unacceptable to the original apostles. They wouldn't recognize it. Corporate slogans in the lobby... Coffee houses and playlands, they would not recognize it. The first century church within Israel, the believing group of people later called Christians, was a community of believers. Somebody say community. Community. Then Christianity moved to Greece and it became a philosophy. Say philosophy. Philosophy. Then it moved to Rome and it became an institution. Say institution. Institution. Then it moved to Europe and became a culture. Say culture. Culture. And then it moved to America and became a business. That is unacceptable. This is not a business. This church and the churches of the One Association 
are not a business. The church of Jesus Christ must not be a business operating in the format and with the ideals of a corporation. It cannot be a profitless, for-profit corporation. It must be directed by God's Holy Spirit and men that have been discipled to follow His Spirit. It must be based on a lifestyle of discipleship that results in whole families, whole communities, actually living and behaving like Jesus and his first century disciples. Can you say amen? Amen. Can we get a better amen than that? Amen. Amen. Those of you scared to speak in church, can you stand up in boldness and say amen? Amen. Amen. See, we are not going to sit back with business as usual because business is not what God wants in His house. He turned over tables and He made a whip to rid His house of business. We are not here to sell you something. We are here to tell you what God's hand is upon us to do and what His graciousness, His divine enablement is on us to do and the words He has said, we will raise up disciples exactly like like the disciples of the first century. Come on, the church of the living God is waiting for leaders to stand up and be the men of God they need to be to begin to repair what has fallen and what is broken. Are you going to be leaders that will rebuild the broken walls? Amen. Amen. One unacceptable thing that a leader cannot do is just sit around and complain about things and that they're wrong. That sounds kind of like something to the left when it comes to government they hear of a problem and seek the face of god that's what a godly leader does when they feel the hand of their god upon them they examine the problem in detail to determine what it will take to fix it come on we've been fixing a lot of vehicles in this church and particularly within the pastoral ship it'd be wrong It would be unacceptable. Say that with me. Say unacceptable. Unacceptable. If you saw the three of us sitting on Eric's driveway with our heads in our hands crying and just complaining about our broken vehicles. But we are the type of men of God. You are the type of men of God that will get up and go fix it in the name of Jesus. It always takes more than what you have, which forces us to invite others to join us in repairing the world. Nehemiah, the godly leader that he was, he invited the people to join him. And you know what? We are inviting you to join us. Amen. Come on, God put you in this church not to be entertained, but to be entertained in the name of Jesus. <laughs> we want to equip you in the name of Jesus. We want you to join the vision that we have so that you can replicate what's here. Their response was, let us start rebuilding. Your response should be let us say it again. Let us start rebuilding. In Wednesday's message, Rick, the slayer with the word of God, exhorted us from Nehemiah 3, verse 8. Let's turn there. I was trying to think of something clever, but it just fell flat. So I'm gonna come back to that in another message. I ain't gonna leave that alone. I'm gonna fix it. Nehemiah 3 8. Uziel, son of Haraiah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. And Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Rephiah, son of Hor, ruler of the half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Jediah, son of Harumpha, made repairs opposite his house. And Hattush, son of Hashbaniah, made repairs next to him. Malkijah, son of Harim, and Hashub, son of Pahath Moab, repaired another section to the Tower of the Ovens. Shalom, son of Haloesh, ruler of half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters in the name of Jesus. Come on, I got four girls. I got some work to do. With all these wonderful Hebrew names that I just butchered, The point of the matter is that there was goldsmiths, perfume makers, men from every walk of life must join this work. The repairs do not start in a foreign land. They must start in your own house. This is exactly what the pastors were speaking of earlier. If you sit in here and are only dreaming of what you will do out there, but you do nothing here, 
you are missing the point of why God put you in this body. The lifestyle we're describing is a whole family affair. Rick laughing in the face of the devil, Lawhon. Yes, yes. Has exhorted us. He's encouraged us. He was studying Nehemiah when it was being prophesied about. Also, the arising church had already determined this was their course before it was prophesied about. Prophecy is always supposed to confirm what God is telling you, not be your only source of what God is telling you. We are not fortune tellers. We are a community of faith that see in each other's life revelation and we respond to it. We compare it with the word. Rick did that for us. And what we're seeing is that the overwhelming message of the Spirit came to us from Nehemiah 3.16. And we're going to jump into that text, which is our main text for today. Beyond him, Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, ruler of the half district of Bethzur, made repairs up to a point opposite the tombs of David. Opposite the tombs of David. As far as... Artificial pool. The artificial pool. Is that a strange thing to see in the text? Yes. And the house of heroes. We are going to take note of three items that were just identified. The first is the tombs, plural, tombs of David. The second is the artificial pool. The third is the house of heroes. First, tombs of David. Second, artificial pool. Third, the house of heroes. I think it's interesting that these three items are still standing there. Something about seeing them reminds us of our present times as we survey the walls of the church world. Amen. I want to show you a scripture that you're probably not familiar with related to the tombs of David. Because David was a very great king, but this is not David's tomb alone. Something else was put in the tomb with David. Pick up with me in Ezekiel. You're going to be in the 43rd chapter, beginning in verse 6. Let me know you are with me when you get there. Three of you. The rest of you. Ezekiel, big book. Turn to the middle of your Bible. Start to hang a right until you find it. Say there. If you don't speak with me this morning, I will come find you. I am that kind of pastor. If that scares you as a guest, you should feel encouraged by it. You're not alone. We're together. And if I know your name, it's very likely that I'll shout out to you. Like Jess's sister when I remember her name. Danielle. Amen. Ezekiel 43 in verse 6. While the man was standing beside me, I heard someone speaking to me from inside the temple. Where is the voice coming from? Inside the temple. He said, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites forever. The house of Israel will never again, somebody say never again, never again, defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings. Now we're going to hear what defiled the name by their prostitution. You know, when the church becomes a business, if the church is a body, if we are the body of Christ and a body is engaged in a business, how is that not prostitution? They defiled God's name by prostitution and the lifeless idols of their kings at the high places. Something about the way the kings conducted their business, something about the idols left unchallenged in the king's life offended God. When they placed their threshold, the king's threshold, next to my threshold and their doorpost beside my doorpost with only a wall between them and me, they defiled my holy name by their detestable practices. I want you to catch this. So I destroyed them in my anger. Now let them put away from me their prostitution and lifeless idols of their kings, and I will live among them forever. There's a slide I want to show you to help you understand this. These are the kings of Judah. Right after Solomon, you have Rehoboam and Abijah and Asa and Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and on and on. Four or five hundred years of kings right here. 
What you see is everything that is in red, the phrase, they did evil in his eyes, appears about them. Everything that you see in gray, they did evil and they did good. There are only two on that list that are said to have done good with all of their hearts. That's Hezekiah and Josiah. Now, what this means is that David, who had a heart like God, was buried in a place. And God was not displeased with that. That place actually shared an adjoining wall with the temple of God. But the kings that they put in there with David... They were supposedly building on David's work, supposedly working with the same priorities, supposedly working from the same foundation. Their very presence offended God because they behaved like prostitutes and they had idols that were unchecked in their life. They did things David did not do while claiming an association with David. What that reminds me of, to put this in context... Is anyone who is claiming that the Lord is their Lord while they are living like the world. And the fact that a man lives around or works in a church, but does things in the world's way, is offensive to God. David was an extraordinary king, very much like King Jesus. But men built monuments to their own lives right on top of David's. The same way that men have taken the great life of Jesus Christ and they built a monument to themselves right on top of his death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah, you can let that sink in for a minute. It's an offense to God to associate an unrighteous man with the holy name just because he works in a church. Greedy swindlers who distort the truth for selfish gain, they cannot be a part of what we are doing. They cannot. There must again be a distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous. The kings of Judah came and went and their lives were summarized by a statement. Usually a single sentence about their life. He either did or did not walk with the Lord. The same will be said of all of us. The foundation of everything that we do is discipleship, but it always begins with repentance. You heard the Spirit calling us this morning. The kingdom is expanding. You must expand with it. Anywhere that your ideals do not match the kingdom, you change. You do not have the right to change anything about the kingdom. There is one precious pattern, one precious standard, and you cannot conform it to your image. You must conform to its image or else you are just like the kings of Judah. You are claiming David as your ancestor and you are building on top of that foundation with something that David never would have used. Man, that's a better word than you guys are responding to. What about you? What would your life, if you had a sentence that summarized your life right now? Are you more, are you closer to King David or one of these other kings here in red? Oh, pastor, we're, we're not in red. Well, some of us in this room are in red. Oh, well, pastor, maybe, maybe I'm just gray right now. You think that's a win? You think that's something that we should be aspiring to is to have a gray? Well, they're doing good, but I also have some bad in my life. What we're talking about is having a distinction from the people around us. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 17. We must have a distinction. What you hear from your pastors is such a fire, is such a burden that there is one standard. And we must, we are charged by the holiness of God to present to you this standard. We must live by it and we must demand the same of you that you come up to this standard. Every single one of us. Because we are pastors who are desiring to know the condition of each one of you. It's not acceptable for us to know that there are people in this room who are living at best in the gray area. At best you're gray. We cannot stand by that. Because that makes us full of prostitution and unaddressed idols. And what you're seeing are pastors that are crying out to you. If we are examining ourselves as your leaders, you must do the same. It is not a suggestion to you that you think about these things, that you ponder them, that you go home and maybe give it a moment's thought. We are demanding of you what the Lord is demanding of us. You must have distinction. You must have a life that is only 
in the good category here and not some other mixed version of what Christianity is actually supposed to be. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 17, it says this, They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them, just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction. Say distinction. distinction. Come on, not everybody is with us here. You will again see the distinction. Say it. Distinction. Between the righteous and the wicked. You ever had any thoughts that you had a hard time figuring out if it was the Lord or the enemy? How can that be? We're, we're going through the, it's either righteous or it's wicked is, the, is what we are working towards, is what the Lord is in fact doing. You will not be allowed to stay in a gray area. I gave the Lord 82% of my life. Then you're 100% wicked. I gave him 98%. You are 100% wicked. What we are seeing here is a God who wants, he will promise He promises that there will be a distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. There's no place for you claiming to serve God. There's no place for you thinking that you've got something on your life and yet living the way that you choose to live. How idolatrous is it of us to do that? Oh, I'm I'm a minister. I've got a ministry to... Do you really? Is there a distinction between you and the people that you're trying to minister to? Do you look more like the people that you are ministering to or the one who sent you to minister? There must be a distinction in your life, in every way, in our speech, in our conduct, in our love, in our life, in our faith, whatever it is. There has to be a distinction here. We are going to serve God as sons, not as hirelings for profit. This is what God is demanding of us. This is why you see your pastors living in the way that you do. We live as open as possible. You know why? We're showing you, if we're strong, we're showing you where we're weak. And we're saying we are reaching out to God and we leave ourselves with no excuse. What about you? There is no excuse. When we're weak, we cry out to Him and we let His strength be made perfect in us. This is where you should be as well. We're going to serve Jesus and not ourselves. Man, that's an easy thing to say. I don't even want you to nod. Of course we're all going to agree to that. God is demanding that there's a distinction in our actions that prove that we're really serving Him. That means he gets, to, he gets to tell us what to do. It's not really serving. It's not really following and submitting to Him if we just do what we want to do. We must follow Him and not ourselves. We're going to follow His Spirit to righteousness, not the Spirit of the world that leads to wickedness. There are people in this room, in a church that is the finest church that I've ever been a part of, In an association that's by far the finest association that I've ever seen. There are people in this room today. There is no distinction. You are at best gray. We cannot let that be acceptable to us today. As your pastors, we're saying it is not acceptable. It is not acceptable for you to remain in that state. You must choose today. You must make movement today. In this service right now. So that you are seeing and being able to operate in an attitude of righteousness and not wickedness. Oh, how I wish that you were either hot or cold. To be lukewarm is to be pukeable. Vomitous. Something that should be purged from the body of Christ. What you see in gray up there doesn't represent partially right and partially wrong. It represents vomit on the history of God's people. What does your life represent? If we cannot tell you from the world because you live and act and operate essentially as the world does, then something is wrong. If the distinctions that you believe set you in the kingdom of God are what you eat and drink and wear then something is wrong. What we're looking for, what the Spirit of God is looking for, are those who obey Him when it hurts. Those who do what He says when nobody else is looking. 
That's what we're looking for. There will always be an easier way. There will always be an alternative path. But if you take that alternative path, you become vomitous to Christ. We speak about the Spirit of God. He makes a distinction. But there's a clarifier of who He is and therefore what He does. He is the Holy Spirit. Another way to say that is that He is the Spirit of Holiness. So when the Spirit of God descends in this room, you know what He's going to do? He's going to make a distinction between what is holy and what is not holy. There was a word that came forth during worship and Miss Joellen had no idea of this next section that we're about to speak of. And the word included the word stagnant. We're going to look at artificial pools from this point moving forward. And an artificial pool is that trying to replicate a living spring of water, but it's man-made and its waters just stay still. They are stagnant. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13. Amen. We're bringing it to Miku. Yes. Say there when you're there. Don't be stagnant. I can tell some of you are being stung a little bit. <laughs> We're an intense group. Oh, yeah. Because that's what the church of the living God is. I want to encourage you as you listen to Tamika encourage us. If you stub your toe, you're probably not silent. If you hit your finger with a hammer, you're probably not silent. If it's stinging a little bit, you don't have to sit there with a dumbfounded look on your face. You don't have to open your mouth and let the flies and gnats begin circulating. You can actually speak. You can, you can let the people around you know this is touching your heart. That it is happening. And do you know what occurs in the community of God when you do that? Everybody begins to realize, yeah, this is not a me problem, a you problem. It's an us problem. We got to do Come something on. now. Come on. Too long we sit as the frozen chosen in here, acting superior because we've received great teaching. Receiving great teaching means nothing. Look behind you. Who are you leading into righteousness? Where is the fruit overflowing from your life? If the fruit from your life are Christians that you can't tell are Christians, if they've been in disease artificial pools for 30 years, and when they come here, they're blown away. That says something about you. Come on. You better get it straight. That's what we're attempting to do here is help you get it straight. Because the Lord is helping us get it straight. We're inviting you into our mission. We're going to make world-changing disciples. Not in name only. World-changing disciples in action, in truth, in deed. Men that are not solo long rangers, renegades, out doing what they like, where they like, with no supervision. What we are doing is working in accountability with each other, the community of God and the Spirit of God. And we're going to raise you up to do the same thing or we're going to call you right out of this body. Exactly. Come on, when we operate in a solo fashion one that is independent of anybody else in the body of Christ and think that we can accomplish God's will with our own two feet and no other, we become an artificial pool. Let's look at exactly what that looks like in Jeremiah 2. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. The way of the Lord is defined by living water, not artificial pools. It is sin. Let me say it again. It is sin to forsake the daily dependence on the Lord that faith requires by building cisterns that water cannot hold. Accumulation is as insulation against faith is offensive to God. Let me read that one more time. Accumulation as insulation against faith is offensive to God. He doesn't want our self-sufficiency. He was, wants our complete dependency. Amen. Doing things in a wise and practical way, as opposed to faith-filled, supernatural way, is offensive to God. Many, many, even in this room, have shipwrecked their vessels of faith on the rocks of security. Pastors just shared something with you that 
Don't mistake his alliteration. Don't mistake the way that he formed the sentence for poetry. It's not. That is piercing, life-giving truth. If we claim to be disciples of Christ, but we insulate ourselves from real risk, insulate ourselves from real loss, if we have accumulated things to insulate us from losing our lives, then we are not living like disciples of Christ. We shipwreck our courageous, bold, manly, daring faith on rocks called security. And we do it in the name of being practical, being wise, being a good steward. It is not being a good steward to lean on your calculator instead of the calculation of the Holy Ghost. I was speaking with a financial planner yesterday. Does that surprise you? We weren't talking about my portfolio. There's nothing in it. He said, the more that I learn about this spirit-filled walk, and this guy is a titan. He said, my job is fairly meaningless. I might be the worst financial planner in the world because all of the strategy, everything that I have been teaching now is irrelevant. It is just what is the Lord saying to you? I said, I am so proud to hear you say that. Your profession is not meaningless. Your colleagues are meaningless. You are priceless. Amen. I want to begin to talk to you about the third word in our group. The third word in the group was house of heroes. In Hebrew, that is bayit for house, gibberim. Heroes is gibberim. It's a special word. Do you see those highlights up there? Brave, strong, mighty. Ladies, do you want to marry somebody who is wimpy, somebody who is fear-filled, somebody who is a feckless weakling? Probably not. I've never met the little girl who was dreaming that somebody would come to her in the tower and cower in fear to the dragon and become just like the oppressors who were holding her captive and say, that is my knight in shining armor. Disciples of Jesus Christ are brave. They are strong and they are mighty. I am unashamed of that. I don't care who thinks it's machismo or macho bravado. They don't understand the spirit of Christ. Our king is a warrior. He is not a dandelion. There are too many candy-coated Christians in this world. Look at the bottom of the slide. Manly, strong, vigorous. Those words ought to be said about disciples. Show me your disciples and I will tell you what kind of tree they came from. How can we come from Christ who is strong and manly and vigorous and brave and strong? How can we be discipled by His Spirit and be spineless lollipops? We cannot. It is time for the courage of conviction in this room. The word gibor, if you like paleo, it's got a beautiful paleo to it. Gimel is gather, bet is family, vav is attach, resh is first, primary or priority. The first place to be brave, courageous, strong, vigorous, manly is in your own home. You cannot go lead the rest of the world. You cannot go lead the rest of the community until you have mastered, say it with me, mastered leading your home. This is the essential step that most are missing. Some of you are heroes abroad and doing okay at home. And what we need is for you to be a hero in your own home. So that you can export that kind of Holy Ghost heroism to the rest of the world. We need that. Say, hey, pastor, I want to be in ministry. You are in ministry. Why do you say you want to be? Well, I mean that day when I'm, you usually mean somewhere else. Start in your own home right now. Amen. Rick told us this in no uncertain terms. You build the wall in front of your house. What is the state of my ministry? Look at the state of your home. 
When you see that in your home is brave for Jesus, courageous for Jesus, vigorous for Jesus, when even your daughter looks like a man among the dandelions that are out there. I tell you what, you should listen to my Abigail preach. She puts some men to shame. She puts most that call themselves men to shame because she has grown up learning to trust the Lord. This is what we have to cultivate. We have to cultivate true, authentic, first century discipleship that says, I'm not only ready to believe on Jesus, I'm ready to die for Him this moment, right now. The passage does not say, the houses of heroes. Did you notice that? It says, the house of heroes. House is singular there. Heroes is plural. There's a reason for that. Although there are many heroes, there is one house, one family. In our logo, we express it in this way. One spirit, one body, one kingdom. The spirit drew you into a body that is made up of heroes. And those heroes have one kingdom, not separate kingdoms. There can be no houses of heroes. There must be one and one only. What we're trying to do today is teach you about becoming a hero. There's not anybody here that wouldn't want to become what we're saying and be a part of the family of the house of heroes. But how do you get there? Where's the starting point? Let's look in 1 Samuel chapter 21 and let's see the starting point of the mighty King David. 1 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 14. Say there when you are there. Aren't you glad that where you started from is not where you have to stay? Thank God for his spirit working in us. Come on, I'm looking at Chris. If you haven't heard Chris's testimony, you're not going to believe that the man, the joyful man that you're seeing now, has been through the things that he's been through. But he didn't stay where he was. I can look across this room and I know your stories. We as pastors, we know where you came from. We know what you've been a part of. And thank God that none of us have to stay there. Let's look at 1 Samuel 21, verse 14. It says this, Achish said to his servants, Look at the man. He is insane. Yeah, I, I, I can resemble that remark. Why bring him to me? Am I short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? Most of the world thought that David was an insane madman. Let's look at the next, next verse, chapter 22, verse 1. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. The madman is in a cave. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him. What did they gather around? A seemingly madman. They gathered around someone who appeared to others to be insane. And he became their leader. About 400 men were with them. Those who were in distress, in debt, and discontented. With the reign of Saul, what did they do? They ran to David. They were in an atmosphere that they knew they couldn't stay where they were. They ran to this David. David became their king before he was king of Israel. He became the king for them long before the rest of the world understood him. Come on now. Aren't we amongst the people who are trying to declare him king of our life? Jesus, we are declaring you king. We're in debt. We're in distress. We are so discontented, but we found the king. The rest of the world doesn't see him, but we do. And we will run to him, even if it's in a cave. Leaders like Nehemiah, David... Are these men soon to be called mighty? All started somewhere. David became their king before he had a kingdom. His kingdom is exemplified throughout their actions. I want you to think about the honor of this for a minute. You may have been in debt. You may have been distressed. You may have been discontented. And you may have been a lot of other things. Maybe demon possessed. Maybe drug addicted. Maybe so many things. 
But if you met him at Adullam, he was your king before he was anybody else's king. That's my king. He was mine before he was theirs. He was my king first. What an honor. Amen. This is the spirit in which you bring people into discipleship. What gives you the right to disciple them? Because he became your king before he was their king. And now you are helping them walk in the road of experience. When I came into the faith, Charlie had been in the faith for many years before me. The things that I thought I knew, I only thought I knew because I didn't even know the right questions to ask yet. He was Charlie's king before he was my king. But something is wrong when you don't meet him at the cave of Adullam. Something is wrong when you were always a pretty good old boy and now you're just a better boy with Jesus. I think you never met him. I think he never became your king. In the body of Christ, there must be radical transformation. It is the basis for a changed life. Without a radical transformation, without a night and day difference, without the expulsion of darkness from your life, then what are you being discipled in? How to be a putrefied Christian? This is what happens when we follow confectionaries rather than revolutionaries. You can like sugary, sweet, little dainty pastors all day long with pretty white teeth because they coat it for you well. But what you need are men and women who challenge you right where you sit and say you must have a revolution in your life. People don't realize what a doulam is. Say, oh man, it's a cave. It was a cave of the discontented. That's not what it means in Hebrew. In Hebrew, a doulam means their testimony, their ornament. Your testimony is not where you were. That's not it. We say, well, I was a drug dealer. I was this. That's not the testimony. The testimony is that you are no longer. Some of you haven't come far enough from Adullam. You still look exactly like you did in the world. You're just a cleaner version of it. You use Christian curse words instead of the real ones. But your heart is relatively unchanged. That's not discipleship. Discipleship is a level of correction in your life that demands revolution. It demands it. You know why people get uncomfortable and walk out of our services? We are demanding something of them. They are not here to be entertained. There are many, many places that will do that. It's a business. You give them money, they give you entertainment. Friends, I'm not a movie theater. Our job is to create world-shaking revolutionaries. I want to show you what we're aiming at. We put it in a graphic for you. Notice that next to artificial pool, it says stagnant resistance. Those were the exact words Joellen prophesied today. Because that righteous woman is filled with the Spirit of Christ. And that is the Spirit of Prophecy. On our road from Adullam to the House of Heroes... We have two paths before us regularly. One is increasing resistance of discipleship that demands transformation. We speak in terms too often of I was changed. You are to continually be being changed. Say I was converted. All that means is you breached the womb and broke the water. That does not mean that you are in the process of discipleship. I got saved at this event. That means absolutely nothing other than you found the starting line. How about running the race? How about pressing into maturity? Would people that have known you for a decade say that you have progressed steadily towards Christ? Or they would say you're the same brat you were on the day you got born again. We must come face to face with this. We have to wrestle with the truths of God because you either go into increasing resistance that transforms you into a hero or you find another way. A stagnant pool. You know those artificial pools because they don't have running water going through them, they get heated by the sun. They become lukewarm. They're pools of vomit when it comes down to it. The foundational path of discipleship is difficult. It requires training, 
sacrifice, devotion. The reason that churches do not do this is they are scared that if they require something of you, you will not return. And their business is dependent upon you returning and you tipping them like a waiter. I serve Christ. I serve Christ by serving you. I do not have the right to judge what I say to you by your response. What I say to you is judged by Christ's response to the words, not yours. I am not scared to challenge you. I am not in the slightest bit intimidated to tell you of sacrifice. Because the man who first called me said to me that I must die daily to be in Christ. I must take up my cross to follow him. There is no other way. If discipleship for you is not increasingly taking your life from you, then you are around disciples, but you are not yet a disciple. All along the way, there are artificial pools. They're designed to deceive you into going another way that will not yield the kingdom results. It will only throw dead bodies on top of King David's work. You end up with a monument that offends God. You end up saying things like, a great leader started our church and we look nothing like him. He would not recognize us and we only like his words, but we do not live like him. Insert your denomination right there. I do not want to build something that offends God. And the more people that we have here, the easier it is for you to get outside of the mainstream and hang in a little corner. It starts by showing up 20 minutes late to a worship service to skip the spiritual part. It then moves into, you only have to go to the bathroom when something is being said about your life. Then you need coffee when your own home is being addressed. And so you're here, but you're not really here. And what happens in this scenario is you spend 10 years in a church and people who have been in it 10 months surpass you because they're disciples while you were sitting trying to gain tenure as if it were a worldly system. That is not who you are. That's not who you're called to be. It's time to raise the standard. No more artificial pools. Our comfort comes from having done the will of God. Our Sabbath comes from having completed His work. Amen. Let's go to Genesis 14, 14. Good word, Pastor. Come on, this should be moving you. It should be shaking you, cutting your heart, challenging you. Do you want to be disciples that increase in resistance? Yes. Amen. We inherited a faith. And that faith is the faith of our father, Abraham. In the way that he demonstrated his trust towards God... Our faith should look exactly the same. And where he started was not where he finished. I want to show you something here in Genesis 14, 14. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive. I want to pause right there. Who is that? Lot. Lot Lot was a wayward sheep that he was shepherding. Always looking for those artificial pools in Sodom and Gomorrah. Wanting to settle into what the world had for him rather than what God had for him. And he got taken captive. How do we know that Abraham went further in the end of his life than where he began? Because what we see here is that he is not only making disciples, he is going after them to the furthest extent. He called out the 300 and trained men born in his household. You know, one of the signs that you are feasting, you are washing, you are drinking from the living waters of God and not dwelling in a cesspool of artificial is that you are able to look in those in your own household and call out of them what God has put inside of them. He had 318 trained men that were born in his household. He didn't order them on Amazon. He didn't get them delivered to him from some other ministry. He raised them himself. That's twice as many people that are sitting in this room right now. And every single one of them were trained men ready to go to war. And at a moment's notice on the call of their master, they got up and they went with them. 
How much do you want to know that you are a leader making disciples? Look behind you. Look right in front of you. What are you doing with your own household? Are you raising up trained men and women of God ready and capable to do the will? They went in pursuit as far as Dan. He took these men with him and he t- pursued rescuing the, the wayward one of Lot to bring him back to the living water of his household. Hey man, what a great passage there in the law. Let's turn to the prophets. First Samuel chapter 30. Let's look at verse 3. First Samuel chapter 30 and verse 3. It says this, when David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Man, how was your day? When they got back, this is what they found. The town destroyed by fire, their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. We read over things like this far too quickly in the Word. These men are crushed in their soul about the situation that they're in. Their wives, their daughters, their sons taken captive. The absolute destruction of what's around them. Weeping until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured. David wasn't above the fray. It wasn't just the men that lost someone. It was David himself. Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Not only is he having the enemies that just trounced his own area, now his own people with such great sorrow want to turn on him. At least we don't do that. At least when great sorrow comes upon us, we don't turn on those who are trying to help us. I think it's best if we don't have a recording device at today's lunches after church we might be eaten more than the fried chicken that's true david was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him each one was bitter in spirit come on i know you guys know this story but can you let it sink in for a minute they were bitter in spirit because of their own sons and daughters but david come on somebody say but david David. he found strength in the lord his god how many things could be, how many more things could be against him? He's got literally everything against him. Then David said to Abathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him and David inquired of the Lord. Is that where you run when things get overwhelmingly difficult? The increasing resistance that's there. Do you realize that this is an opportunity for God's power to be made manifest in you? We are far too quick to say this, to say yes to this, but then we try to do everything in our own strength. Everything we do, we try to do it in our own. We try to do it on our own. We try to see what we can figure out and what we can achieve and what we can do. And what we should be doing is finding the ephod and calling out to God that he might empower us, that he might direct us, that he might disciple us rightly. Shall I pursue this raiding party, Lord? Can I go after him? Can I go get them? Pursue them, he said. (sighs) Man, we don't have time to just camp out on this, but you and I both know that we can. What are you supposed to be going after in your life? What area of the wall is broken down right in front of your house that you got to go pursue, Curtis? That you got to go get, Assad? You got to go get these things, Spencer? You're asking, should I go get it? Yes, the word of the Lord to you is go get it. (laughs) Go pursue this. You will certainly overtake them. You will certainly do what the Lord is requiring of you. The more and more resistance, you can be certain that His power will overcome in you. You can be certain of this. Let's go get it. Let's pursue this today. There's something you need to know about this. Theologians say, hey, how how did David do this? He's not supposed to take an ephod. That is, that's the priest's job. You need to get something. You need to understand it right away. I may be a priest in here, but in your home, you're the priest of your home. We say, hey, David, David took the job of the priest. No, he stepped into the role that was his. Somebody took his wife. He heard from God for his wife. Me 
many times you're running to some other man of God to say, hey, what do I do? What do I do? You're the priest in your home. Stand up and fight for your home. Once you've heard from God that the outcome is certain, it won't matter what everybody else says. This takes us right into Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. What does it mean to train them? Well, they'll learn the Scripture. Well, usually when people say that, their kids aren't actually learning the Scripture. But it means so much more than that. David was a warrior in his own right, wasn't he? He'd been killing things since his youth. He wouldn't fit in very well in today's culture. He did not lean on his ability when crisis hit. He fell at the face of the Lord, heard from God, and only engaged in the battle that God strengthened him to engage in. See, we are to train our children how to fall at the feet of the Lord and say, Of course I want to fight, Lord. You made me to be a warrior. Is this a battle that you want me to engage in? Because your children must know the difference between their strength, which is an artificial pool, and the strength of the Lord, which will make them into a hero. The kingdom is not about men who were strong. It's about men who were weak and became strong. Are you training your children? How are you training your children? Well, I taught them how to say this verse. You are so wrong. Teach them how to live this verse. Focus less on the fact that they can get it right in this translation and get it right in the the life of the child. How will they learn to depend upon the strength of the Lord to hear from God for their own houses if you are not doing it? See, everybody wants to go minister somewhere and they are neglecting the one place they are supposed to be ministering. If your children get in trouble and the first thing they do is drop to their knees, raise their arms and say, Lord, strengthen me one more time that I might slay this Philistine, then you're doing a good job. If they get in trouble and think, I need to go to the latest revival somewhere and hear from a great man of God, you have not trained them in the ways of Christ. Let's turn to Luke chapter 6. In the same idea, not only are we training in our homes, but let's look what discipleship produces. Luke chapter 6 and verse 40. It says this, The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. So what does it mean if you are not yet like your teacher? You are not fully trained. The entire process of discipleship promises that when you are fully discipled, you will be like your teacher. You will be able to do the things that your teacher has done. (laughs) And it's our great desire here to make sure that you go further than we have. When we are being discipled by Christ, the ultimate rabbi who is training us, we will be like him. When He appears, we will be like Him. That means we will have been fully discipled, able to do what He can do. And as we work through this, this is exactly what the Lord is calling us. You are not above the teacher. Everyone who is fully trained will be just like the teacher. What an encouraging thought. If you hear that and realize how short you have fallen, then what you should do is commit yourself more to the training, not less. I don't know why it is that we have a a tendency as humans that when we don't like something, we pull back. Our natural reaction is to get away from it. What a disciple learns how to do is to press in. That you keep going forward. You don't let it go back. We don't let the offense, we don't let the scandalons of offense trip us up every single time by pushing us back away from the presence, away from the rabbi, away from the presence of God. We press into it that we might be like him. Amen. 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 Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 2. Come on, this fire is getting hotter. This word is getting stronger. This is what God is speaking to this church right now. Revelation 3, 2 says, wake up. 
Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have, found, have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. In light of what Pastor Wade was speaking of, so many times as pastors, what we hear from people within this congregation is, I love what Eric does, I love what Wade does, I love what Matt does, and even the elders, but I just, I, I can't be like you guys. I can't live up to the standards that y'all hold above my head. It's just, I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't do this or do that. The reason that Jesus put you in this church was that we were going to pour our lives into you to bring you to where we are. You know, there was a day in time when we didn't know anything. In fact, we were lost. We had to be born again just like you. We had to be trained just like you. We had to sacrifice and increase in resistance and through discipleship just like you. We're asking you to do the same things that we have done, and we are all going to reach that standard of Christ being formed inside of us. Tenure will not get you there. I don't know any other way to say it. I'm going to keep saying it, and I hope that it hurts your feelings. Your years in the kingdom are meaningless if they did not produce an increasing resistance in your life that increasingly transforms you into the presence of Christ, Amen. the image of Christ. Years mean nothing. You can spend years standing somewhere and it does not in any way affect your life. They're actually an indictment against you, not an accreditation to you. Yes. If you have not essentially changed in five years, then you have wasted five years in the kingdom. Yeah. You are to be being transformed. So it is a very reasonable thing to say, in what way has the Lord fundamentally revolutionized my life and character this year? In any year that you don't have an answer to that, you need to repent and be discipled. Amen. This is why you can spend 10 years somewhere and somebody catch you from behind, outrun you, and you simply say they're in a different class of Christian. Yeah. There are no classes of Christian. There's only one kind, a radical one. Second Timothy 3.16 is something that people quote, but it is not present in the way that it must be in our daily lives. All scripture, how much scripture? All. Is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting. And here's what we've been talking about for an hour. Training in righteousness. The Christian is ever becoming more righteous. More like Christ, less of you, more of Him, so that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see examples of this everywhere. Think on the One Association churches, the Arising Church. Pastor Slaughter and Pastor Massey are extraordinary, revolutionary men. The elders, Ben and Mark, if you look at their lives in the last three or four years, they don't resemble the people they were, and I liked them three years ago. That's incredible. When you think along the lines of Ehad to Peru, what are you going to say about Buddy Brasso in five years' time? Come on. Yeah. We have seen him go from a physical therapist to a revolutionary before the Lord. We, you watch a man like Santiago and see what he does. About King's Harvest with Pastor Justin Johnson. Come on, somebody say Justin Johnson. Justin Johnson! That brother is an amazing man of God. He is having other men that are joining with him, Jeremy and Will, David and Eli, who are learning and becoming transformed every day. Every day into powerful men of God. When you see three pastors standing here before you, you realize Matthew and I met in a fist fight? The first time that I met Wade, I wasn't sure I liked him. <laughs> we have been transformed into what we are and we're not alone. Who could argue about the growth in Charlie Brown's life? Don't think because he's so far ahead of you that he's not growing. I, I, he's always been ahead of me and he's light years ahead of where he was. You know, that gives me encouragement. Yeah. Look at what's happened in Baj Harazina's life in the last six years. That's incredible. And they're not alone. 
Take a, a glance at a family like the Molochs and see where they were and where they are. Look at the Carters. Look at the laughing at the devil law huns. What you are seeing in these families is radical progression towards Christ. That is what we want to imitate. That is what we are lifting up to raise up the standard. We've had the awesome opportunity to join Love and Care Ministries in India with Pastor Ann in Israel, seventh generation of Christian and pastor in his family. His father, Raja, able to oversee, give wisdom and insight. And when we first met them, they were at 18 churches. Now they're in the 20s, 25, constantly opening up new wells of living water in a country that is less than 1% Christian. Come on, what about New Life Church with Pastor Eric Treister? Man, what a faithful man of God, raising up clay, raising up that young man. When you see him on a, you never know, you'll turn around on a Monday night at Foundations and see Pastor Treester and Clay sitting right next to you. Amazing man of God. You can check out as far as Romania and see a church like New Family, Radu and Dalia. They have endured as much as anybody I've ever seen, defections, all kind of things. And you know what? They hold their head up and they press forward and lives are changing along the way. They appointed elders this year. Those men are godly men who they are receiving, shepherding from and working in a team. This is radical revolution. We have in the house One Light Ministries with Brent Vincent and his family. Come on. This past or this month marking two years of being in Indonesia. Come on, learning the language that is completely different from English. And God gifted him with a, a young man of God to work beside him whose name is Geary. Come on, what a treasure it is to participate in this ministry with this family, seeing them open up wells of salvation in Indonesia. Think about the remnant church that is being formed right now in Denton, Texas. Pastor Mike Hutchinson. Raising up young men like Kaysen, who is there and thriving in everything in the discipleship process that Pastor Hutchinson is providing. When we say radical and revolutionary, don't think of a caricature. This does not mean that they have to wear boots or drive a diesel truck or have some beautiful beard. <laughs> There are men exactly like Zeke Lamb who happen to be handsome, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, incredible FBI agent-looking pastors. Yes. Yes. And they're changing the world around them, smooth face and all. They can take a guy like Jake, a guy like Zach, and they can turn them into devil-stomping, gates of hell kicking down revolutionary. Our goal is not to engage in each other's eccentricities. It is an ever-increasing resistance in discipleship that forms us into mature and strong men. The kind of thing that Hebrews 3, 6 says. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. Do you want to be a faithful son? Yes. yes. And we are His house. If. Somebody say if. If. if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast, we are a courageous, hopeful group of revolutionaries. That is what we are called to. We are inspired by men who forsake artificial pools and they go the difficult way of the cross. I want to read this to you out of Proverbs 25, 26. Like a muddy spring or polluted well is a righteous man who gives way to the wicked. They are not going to sit in a place that was once stirred but is no longer. Where healing once occurred but does so no longer. They will not sit by stagnant waters when God is a raging river. Is the Lord a raging river? Yes. Then we must ask ourselves, do we reflect the mighty rushing river of God? We are an hour and 18 minutes into a message that's three times the length of the contemporary Christian message. And we're not anywhere near done. Amen. Turn with me to John 5. I want to talk to you about a raging river of God. And I'll be preaching to you, not somebody else. Isn't it good to come and get a relevant word? I'm not talking about your neighbor. I'm talking about your life. In John 5 and verse 1, some time later, 
Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool. What have we been saying about pools all day? Which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a number of disabled people used to lie. Yeah, the artificial pool is full of disabled people. They disabled themselves. They got off of the right way and into the easy way. They're crippled. Some of them just don't know it. The blind, spiritually I'm speaking of. Lame, the paralyzed. One who, who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Lay aside the physical application for just a second. Do you want to be a spiritual invalid? No. How many years will you lay in a pool that is stagnant? You are not growing. You are not being pushed. You are not challenged. Listen, if you're not having to fight off painful statements that apply to you personally in this church, you're not engaging. He was there 38 years. How many years have you wasted in shallow water Christianity that is lukewarm, produce nothing? If you have a hard time seeing that, you're not looking at your life soberly. That is most of Christianity. They go where it is easy. They live where it is easy. All they have to do is believe, they say. There is no agonizing fight of faith because they took the artificial route. This guy was laying there, but he's crippled. In some manuscripts, it says an angel once stirred the waters, but he does so no longer. What is that speaking of, saints? Well, our church in the 15th century rocked the world. Well, good for the 15th century. You've been crippled for five centuries since. Are you hearing me? When we live in the artificial pool, we're lame and blind. We're invalid in Christ. The original apostles would not recognize us. So look what Jesus said to him. Do you want to get well? It seems like an insensitive question. Because we're not reading it for all it's worth. It is a very reasonable question if somebody sitting by a pool that was once stirred, but is no longer, do you even want to get well? If you keep doing what you have always done, you will keep getting what you've always gotten. Do you like your past? So, oh, you know, I, I just don't think it's that bad. Well, this might not be the church for you. Because we are interested in growing further tomorrow than we did today. We will never rest on our laurels. We will never sit back and say, well, that was good enough. Because our king deserves the obedience of every nation on earth. Starting with us. Amen. Starting with our own homes. Starting with our children. Amen. We act like we're victims of our circumstance when the truth is we've just been hanging out by artificial pools. Do you want to get well? Yes. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. By the way, it hasn't been stirred in years. That's why he's been crippled 38 years. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Do you notice the astounding lack of empathy that Jesus has for his position? Come on. The Bible is not an empathy session. It is not a bunch of spiritual sympathizers. It says, this is the kingdom of God. Pivot, turn, and get in it. Amen. And men who will are benefited by the kingdom. See, you're coming face to face with the actual cost of discipleship. Even as Nehemiah came face to face with the situation about the walls. We're inviting you to get up and to walk. Not to bring your spiritual lost puppies to your pastors, but instead disciple them. Not to bring every problem in your family to your pastor, but put on the ephod and hear from God and go to war. Amen. When it comes down to it, we actually think more of you than you think of you. True. You're waiting for somebody else to do what we know God has called you to do. Amen. We want to train you for it. We want to encourage you in it. Oh my God, we want to stand beside you on the day of battle. But what we don't want to do is let you elect us to be your champion while you sit on your salvation and we do the work. Amen. 
it is time for the church of Jesus Christ to pick up their mats and walk, then our names will never be written in the dust. <laughs> Jeremiah 17, 13 says this, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake, forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord. Listen to this. The spring of living water. They've taken the artificial pool and that has been satisfactory for them. And their names are written in the dust because they have forsaken him. We are the type of church who will get up, pick up our mats, and start fighting exactly as the Lord prescribes. Let's go to John 37, 37. In fact, I'll just read it to you. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Yes. Whoever believes yes. in me. As the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. That's no artificial pool. That's the raging river of God. <laughs> By this he meant the spirit. I'm so glad the scripture helps us define that. Whom those had, who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. They will be written in the rolls of the house of of the mighty men, those who come and search for that living water. Hebrews 11 chronicles men who refuse to trust in this world and its ways, but instead relied on the power of God. Men like Enoch, despite the artificial pools of a corrupt generation, Enoch chose to walk with the Lord and to please Him to the point that physical death could not hold him. In fact, he seemed to walk so closely with the Lord that they were just joined in the Spirit. Isaac, when kicked out of Abimelech's artificial pools of provision, he went to reopen Abraham's wells of promise. Mm. It was Jacob who wrestled with God and was transformed by the power of God and brought about the Lord's inheritance, the next generation of lionhood. Oh, man. <laughs> Mm. Moses refused to be comforted by the artificial pools of Egypt and instead chose to lead God's people to living water. Amen. Amen. Rahab, the prostitute, escaped her national destiny of the artificial pools of disobedience by protecting God's servants, and she gained an inheritance even into the line of Christ. Amen. Mm. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Although Barak was the fiercest warrior of his day, he didn't succumb to the artificial pool of self-reliance. Instead, he refused to go into battle without the anointed word from the Lord's prophet. And so he drank from the spring of total dependence on the Spirit of God. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Jephthah, the least of his brothers, became their leader. A bitter root that became sweet victory. Amen. He was made strong by the Spirit, became mighty in war. Amen. Amen. Come on now. King David, he was rejected by men, but chosen by God. He fought from a cave and from the throne he led men. He slayed animals and he slayed giants. <laughs> he shepherded sheep. And he shepherded all of Israel because he trusted his God. Amen. 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 When the entire priesthood went astray by doing what was right in the artificial pool of their own eyes, Ooh. God set apart a boy named Samuel who would be. 
be loyal to him. He transformed him into a man of God who led the entire nation back to the Father. Yeah. Come on now, St. Saps. That is the Hebrews' faith. Hall of Fame, where will your name be listed? Is your Bible as big as theirs? Is your God as big as theirs? Is your faith as big as theirs? Hebrews 11 contains this phrase in the 34th verse. It says their weaknesses were turned into strength. We are not talking about strong men made stronger. We are talking about a journey that goes from distress and discontentment and disillusion and adulam. And their testimony is they didn't stay there. They turned right into the kingdom in all of its ever narrowing way. And that transformed them into the kind of men that inspire us that's what discipleship is it is the transformation into something that inspires the world Romans even says that the creation itself is waiting for you to arise in this manner Isaiah 50 10 who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant let him who walks in, in the dark who has no light Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. But now all you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. The history of the house of heroes descends from the times of Genesis. But as it enters the first century, think upon Capernaum. As we are working towards a close here, make sure that your minds and your hearts are staying attentive with us. In John 6 and verse 58, it says this, This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Capernaum is the word Kapur, Nahum, the village of the prophet Nahum. Jesus is standing in this area, and the house of Nahum was an extremely difficult, a hard word for the people to hear. To be in this house of the mighty, we have to stay in the house. What it means to stay in the house is that His word is above our word. That His word is above our likes, our dislikes, what we prefer, our own comfort, our own way. We have to stand in the same spirit and the same attitude that Jesus is displaying here in Capernaum. In the very same passage, the response of the people in that day is the same as the church world today. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? See, we're told time and time again, we cannot do what we do and build a church. And yet here we are. I'm suggesting if you're doing something else, what you have built is not actually a church. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? (laughs) What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. What does the flesh count for? What does the flesh count for? The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. There, yet there are some of you who do not believe. Do you hear how Jesus spoke to those who were his disciples? For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. So the question becomes for you, has the Father enabled you to come to Jesus? Or are you just hanging out in the warming pool? From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. See, this is not an artificial pool of stagnant resistance. Every day that goes by, Jesus' way is getting more and more narrow. Every day it's requiring them to trust the spiritual nature of his words and not the fleshly natural thinking of their own carnal minds. Every day it got harder, not easier. Does that describe your walk? Because that might tell you which of those two red lines you are on. You do not want to leave two, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. 
See, Jesus was not seeker friendly. Jesus was not begging anyone to follow him. The truth was the truth. And the truth was worthy of the greatest sacrifice, the greatest obedience, the greatest commitment. If we were peddling something that was not the truth, then we might feel the need to sell it to you and make sure that it conformed to your likes and dislikes. It's precisely because we are sharing what we have heard from God that we do not do that. Instead, we are setting the truth before you plainly and inviting you to join us in this great revelation and become a part of something that will, in fact, be a movement of God on the earth that Elder Charlie first saw in 1993. Simon Peter answered in much the same way that I hope your hearts will answer. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. All the rest of the crowd returned to Jeremiah's cistern. They returned to the artificial pool. Their names will be written in the dust for forsaking the spring of living water. They are building tombs and throwing dead bodies on top of the work of Jesus. But they are an offense to God. All because the gospel was so radical... And they were just so normal. See, we're not supposed to be normal. We are not supposed to be cutesy, get along, nice little cookie cutter Christians. We are supposed to be a dramatic affront to this world system. Everything about us should be challenging to everyone around us. Woe to you. When all men speak well of you. We do have a choice which way we live. In 2 Peter 2, verse 17 says, These men are springs without water, and mist driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For they mouth empty, boastful words. And by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a man is slave to whatever has mastered him. This is the path of artificial pools and being in that cesspool of stagnant resistance. The other choice that we have, the one you see, escalating to the house of heroes by means of increasing resistance and discipleship, results here in 1 Peter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This takes us to our decision moment. I have been told time and time again that all a Christian must do is believe on Jesus. I'm here to tell you that is completely untrue. The demons in hell know exactly who Jesus is. Sometimes they confess it. But it does nothing for their eternal state. It is not true that all you must do is believe on Jesus. Your belief must be accompanied by a lifetime of action that proves out your belief. Or the Bible says you don't actually believe it. There could be no more piercing scripture today than the shortest scripture that we shared. It was Luke 640. And we're going to put it on the screen The student is not above the teacher. Let's take that in the Peshat. Do you know what that means? If they killed him, then they shouldn't like you. The ones that should like you are the ones that have died themselves and want to become like you. The ones that are hanging out in artificial pools will hate you. They should want to crucify you. If you are looking for a more socially acceptable gospel, you are trying to find an artificial pool. It doesn't exist, not a real gospel. 
The real gospel puts you in the same position as Jesus to the rest of the world. A very few love you enough to die with you, but most would rather Barabbas than you. Radical discipleship transforms you into your teacher. Everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. If you're getting along just fine with the world, but the world killed Jesus, then you are not fully trained. You are not reflecting Him appropriately. If you are living without any controversy, any challenge, any conflict, then you are not like your teacher. He was a prince of peace and at war on every page of the Bible. A fully trained disciple shakes things up everywhere he goes. Starting in his own family. That's not an insult. It's an admonition. There are families in here that are going to be ministering elders for years to come. We're not going to have another generation that has no elders. We are raising them right now all over this room. We're going to guide pastors for years to come. Plant works all over the world, but it starts in your own home. And when your home is so much like Jesus that the others on your block don't know what to do with you. When you go to Walmart and the people are sneering at you. When you can't leave a restaurant without addressing a secret in somebody's heart that they didn't want addressed. Well, then you're becoming like your teacher. We are putting you on a collision course with what the life of Jesus and the disciples of Jesus look like. We did it from every section of the Bible. We did it from every age of biblical history. And you see fine examples all around you. We are not the only ones. There are 10 churches in the one association. And that's not by far the only ones. There's 25 in India alone that we just haven't told you about. And yet it's rare. It's precious. And it's worth giving your life to. So I'm going to tell you very blunt, very honestly. We didn't compromise this in the beginning and I'm not about to compromise it now. We won't change not one little bit of this for your liking because that would change all of us. What we will do is lay it out plainly and say, you please, please have the courage, the depth of conviction to be transformed and go with us. And you know what I know from pastoring for 25 years? Some of you will say yes and will not go. Others of you will go, I don't think that's for me. And the Spirit of Christ will compel you and you will go much further than you ever thought. Some of you that look like heroes today will be tomorrow's deserters. And some of you that are sure your failures today are tomorrow's heroes. I know that. I've seen it time and time again. And since I can't pick them, then I'm going to let the Holy Ghost do it. We will take you every bit as seriously as you are yielding to the Spirit of God and living in a supernatural manner. But as long as you're talking about carnal systems, artificial pools, and salvaging your own life rather than clinging to salvation, you're just not going to get much out of this fellowship. You'll warm yourself by our fire is all that will happen. You get to choose today. A stagnant artificial pool. That's a respectable distance in the eyes of most Christians today. You'll be able to quote the same doctrine that I quote, but your life will look 100% different than mine has. Or a path with no coasting, no quitting, no days off, continual transformation. Then your hair will be as gray as Charlie and Bosch. But your life will be every bit as full as theirs as well. Me and my household, we've chosen. We're not bowing at the altar of mediocrity. We're going for Jesus or die trying. Would you stand to your feet? 
There is no group of people in the world that I love any more than you, but there are a bunch that I love every bit as much as you. And I want to tell you exactly what Jesus told to those who hear him. And what the Spirit of God said to Ezekiel. If I sent you to a people of obscure speech, they'd listen to you. But I sent you to the stubborn house of Israel. You know, what defines a stubborn house? It's whichever one is the most natural to you. You can say, that's just Eric. That's just Wade. You can dismiss this as, you know, those are just excitable guys. But I can absolutely assure you we could preach this message all over the world and every person who heard would be in the valley of Jehoshaphat making their decision. Don't show contempt for the Spirit of God because you're familiar with us. Ask Him now what you must do. Ask Him what your life must look like tomorrow. Now is the time for self-reflection. Only you can take this next step. That's only you can do that. But I want to tell you the truth. That next step, it may take you into the immeasurable things that little Eve prophesied about today. The Lord designed this for you. And we've labored at it for an hour and 45 minutes. So we're going to leave you with the Spirit of God now as we worship.